Hello, everyone. My name is Yelena, and this is the Petite Writer Podcast. In today's episode, we'll discuss how to submit a short story to a magazine, but from the perspective of a reader for that particular magazine. I've chosen this topic because I know that there are many writers out there who are having a hard time dealing with rejection. They keep getting rejected, and yet they don't understand what they're doing wrong. Because the reader is the first person who will actually read your story, it's good to know what they're thinking. As someone who has been an editor for about 10 years and an active reader for literary magazines for about seven years, I feel that I can confidently share my knowledge and experience to help writers understand what actually happens when their story reaches its first reader, or in other words, the first person who will see your story at the magazine where you've submitted it, and who will then decide whether or not your story should move on to the next stage. We will discuss what the job of the reader is, what actually matters to the reader, misconceptions that are made by writers, why you don't receive feedback as a writer, how long it takes for a reader to decide if the story is good, and what the actual process of reading submissions looks like. Let's start by discussing what a reader for a literary magazine actually is. A reader is someone who is tasked with reading through the first round of hundreds, sometimes even thousands of submissions that are sent to a magazine, and deciding which of these should move on to an assistant editor or the editor-in-chief, depending on how big the magazine is. If the magazine is particularly large, there may be numerous levels of readers for a story to go through before it reaches any one of the editors. However, typically, a decent-sized online literary magazine will have one round of readers sorting through the many submissions, one round of assistant editors sifting through the remaining submissions, and then the editor-in-chief who will decide which story will be sent to publication. Although the term reader can be a paid profession, the vast majority of readers are not paid for their work. They often receive a mention on the first page of the printed magazine or on the magazine's website, but that's about it. A reader is chosen based on their experience in the field of literature. This could be based on their education, their own publications, their editing experience, or their visible passion in the literary world as a reviewer or critic. And in some cases, for the really big magazines, All of these are taken into account when choosing a reader. Even though the work is not paid, the reader is expected to organize their personal time so that they have long hours left over to read the many submissions that will soon be coming their way. There is nothing glamorous about this job, which is why many people choose not to do it. Many people run from the job after working through one or two volumes for the magazine because of how tedious the work can be. But some people, like myself, have developed a love for this kind of work and have noticed a pattern when it comes to the submissions that they have to go through. When they first start their job, readers are usually very vigilant about reading every story from beginning to end. After months or years on the job, many readers stop reading the entire story and usually allow the writer no longer than the first page to impress them. We will discuss this further a little later. Usually, each story is read by at least two readers and sometimes even three. They mark the story with a yes, no, or maybe. However, readers are always encouraged to stay away from the maybe button and to decide as soon as possible whether or not a story should move on to the next stage. Ultimately, the job of the reader is to find the great stories that grab them and make them want to read more. Stories that start off with great promises from the very beginning and show the potential to fulfill these promises and possibly even exceed them. We will talk about story promises a little later in this podcast, but do let me know if you'd like me to dedicate a full episode on story promises alone. 
Next, let's move on to what it actually feels like to be a reader. In order to make this as linear as possible, let's imagine that today is a day that I've allocated for reading, and I'll take you through everything that I do as a reader when I sit down to sort through the submissions that have been assigned to me. With an obligatory hot drink next to me, I sit at my computer and open Submittable, which is the program that most magazines use to manage their submissions. My next step is to sort the manuscripts according to their submission date. I start with the manuscript that has been in the queue the longest, and then work my way towards the present date. Before I click to open a manuscript, I see the story's title, the name of the author, the type of submission or genre that it has been submitted for, and the date. If the magazine is holding an anonymous competition, then the name of the author will be hidden. In my case, the only thing that really sticks out before I open the manuscript is the story's name. The author's name is something that I don't focus on even if I see it. The next thing I see is the short bio or the cover letter that was submitted by the writer. And I'd like to stop here for a moment and discuss the cover letter. Usually, there is contact information on the top left side, followed by Dear Editor or Dear Name of the Editor, and then the cover letter. I don't usually read these cover letters. I don't read them because I want to get to the story as soon as possible, and also because they all usually say the same thing. Writers always list their university if they hold an MFA, followed by a list of their previous publications and also prizes if they've won any. They then end by letting us know whether or not this is a simultaneous submission or if it may have been previously published in another magazine or on a website. I did some research before I recorded this podcast to see what the current advice on the topic of cover letters is, and from what I can tell, the advice has not really changed since I first started as a reader. Although there is nothing essentially wrong with naming your university, your degree, your previous publications, or your awards, to me as a reader, these things don't really mean anything. I am not choosing a story to go on to the next stage based on the writer's previous experience. I am choosing a story to go on to the next stage if, and only if, it is a great story that deserves to go through. As far as I'm concerned, this could be the very first thing that you've ever written in your life. If it's great, if it grabs me, if it is well written with developed and believable characters, I will accept the story and pass it on to the next reader. You could be published in the Paris Review for all I care, but if this particular story that you've sent me is bad, it's not going any further. Therefore, the first thing that I want to mention here is that you should never listen to advice that tells you that your credentials or your previous publications will help you to get published again. I am not assessing your story based on your previous work. I am assessing it based on the work that is currently in front of me. Remember, I'm choosing stories for a short story magazine. People who purchase that magazine want to read short stories. They don't want to read cover letters. Next, I open the manuscript file and quickly scan the first page without actually reading anything. This quick scan tells me a few things. One, whether or not you have properly formatted your manuscript according to the magazine's instructions. Two, whether or not you have kept the length of your story to what the magazine has specified that it accepts, and three, whether or not you understand basic grammar when it comes to writing fiction. This includes your ability to properly format dialogue and to start new paragraphs. And of course, if my word processor is flashing with red underlined sections, it means that you have not properly proofread your manuscript. Now, here is the reason why this first quick scan is important. Obviously, if the manuscript has not been formatted properly according to the magazine's instructions, I already cannot let it go through and I will proceed to click on the No button, which will automatically reject the manuscript. Likewise, 
If the writer doesn't understand basic dialogue formatting, I will notice it right away on the first page and, once again, reject the manuscript without reading it. Likewise, if the writer doesn't understand basic dialogue formatting, I will notice it right away on the first page and, once again, reject the manuscript without reading it. Now, you may be wondering, well, why don't you just help me format my manuscript? Or, why don't you just help me fix the dialogue? What if my story is great, but you didn't even read it? The answer to this is because there is no time. There is literally no time for anyone at the magazine to do this for you. The readers are swamped with submissions and can barely manage to get through all of them. Likewise, the editors have a lot of work of their own that they have to deal with. No one at the magazine has time to help you fix something that, to be honest, should not have been a mistake in the first place. Now, if you make a few spelling mistakes in your manuscript, that's not the end of the world, and you shouldn't panic if you've submitted a manuscript and you then notice that you've misspelled a word. I'm talking about the glaring mistakes that should absolutely not be present in a manuscript that has been submitted for potential publication. Now. Assuming that the writer has followed the magazine's guidelines, I can begin to read the story. Personally, out of respect for the writer, I always try to read the story all the way to the end. However, as an experienced reader, I can tell whether or not the story will be good by the end of the first page, and often even sooner. Because short stories tend to start in the middle of a scene, you need to be able to portray to the reader what is going on and who the characters are as quickly and as concisely as possible, and you need to state what the promises of your story are by the end of the first page. A story promise is what a reader can expect from your story by the time they reach the end. Will it be a drama, an adventure, a mystery, or a romance, for example? Regardless of what the main genre that you are submitting to is, each main genre has subgenres that go with it. A sci-fi short story can, for example, be a sci-fi romance or a sci-fi horror story. Likewise, a drama can be historical drama, crime drama, period drama, or many others. This is one of the first places where you can distinguish your story from the many other manuscripts that the reader will go through. The vast majority of stories that I read start off very, very vague. They don't tell me where the story is taking place, who these characters are, or what I can expect from it. If you promise me, for example, a crime drama where their characters have found themselves in the middle of a very dangerous situation, a reader is much more likely to be drawn to your story. On the other hand, if you drag the story on for five pages before actually explaining anything, you are not on the right path to be published. Like I mentioned, I will read your story till the end, out of respect for the time and effort that you've put into it, because I am also a writer and I know what you've been through to write this story. But many readers will not, and even though you may not think that this is fair on their part, you really cannot blame them because every reader has their own time frame to be drawn into a story, and most will not go past the first page. To show you what I mean, I'll read you a famous opening line from a crime fiction novel. Hale knew, before he had been in Brighton three hours, that they meant to murder him. This is a famous opening line from Graham Greene's book Brighton Rock. You don't need to have read the book to be drawn into the story. Look how many story promises are made with a single sentence. From the get-go, you are promised danger, crime, fear, and probably a chase between the characters where someone is probably not going to make it out alive. It may sound silly to you when you are writing your own story, because you may not notice how long it takes you to reveal the point of your story, but it is crucial to tell the reader what they are in for as soon as possible, because you want the reader to stay for the promises that drew them to your story. If you can start your short story with a short story promise, a clear premise, and good writing, you are already on your way to a much higher possibility of seeing your manuscript published. 
Now, if the story starts out strong, I read it with a slower pace and focus on really immersing myself into the story. As long as the story is good, and as long as it builds on its promises, I continue to read it at this steady pace. By the time I reach the end of the story, I have firmly decided whether or not this story deserves a yes or a no. I personally never click maybe. Then, I will either click yes, leave a quick note, and assign the story to the next reader, or I will click no, and the writer will receive a rejection email in their inbox. In both cases, the writer will not receive any feedback from me about their story. I will then move on to the next story on the list, and I will do the same thing again. Now, one of the biggest things that I see writers be upset about is that they do not receive any feedback about their story. They have no idea why their story was rejected, or why it was accepted even. Once again, the reason behind this is not that a reader doesn't care to help you be better, it's that a reader does not have time to help you be a better writer. And you might be thinking, can't you just take three minutes out of your time to send me a quick note about what was wrong? But sadly, I cannot. Think of it this way. When I log into my submittable, there are a minimum of 100 stories waiting for me to read. If I spend an extra three minutes on each story given feedback, that's another 300 minutes or another five hours of work. If being a reader was my job and my source of income, I would have no problem doing this. But because I am not paid for this job, even though I love it, I still have to prioritize my day job in order to continue to make a living. And I cannot leave feedback for one story and not another because that would not be fair. Either everyone gets feedback or no one does. And in this case, no one does. When I was preparing for this episode, I read through some of the most popular articles on the topic of submitting short stories, and there seems to be a general opinion about readers that I don't think is true. Neither the reader nor the editor want to be done with you as soon as possible. Readers do this job because they love to read and because they truly want to find a great short story to show off to the world and to support writers from all over the world. There is no competition between me as a reader and you as a writer. First, because I usually cannot be published in a magazine where I am a reader. And second, because there is plenty of space for everyone, no matter where you are in the world. There are so many magazines and platforms where people can find your work that it is almost ridiculous to think that a reader would reject you solely because they are jealous or because they don't want to see your work go through. In fact, I have often searched for writers who I enjoyed reading on social media and followed them, without of course revealing that I was ever a reader for any of their work. Even though it may not always seem like it, you and the reader are on the same team. It's just that sometimes you don't find each other at the right time or in the right magazine. I love being a reader because it allows me to read stories from all over the world by people from different cultures and unique life experiences. Now, I understand that writers have many more questions that they would like to discuss, so if you have any questions or topics that you would like me to cover through my first-hand experience, please feel free to let me know. I hope that you enjoyed this episode of the podcast. If you'd like to contact me, you can do so on Twitter. My handle is at the petite writer, or you can visit my website, which is www.thepetitewriter.com. Thank you for listening. See you next time.